on this edition of It's a Miracle. When two boys lost in the woods become separated, one of them finds his way to safety. I was on my way home, and I see this little boy coming out of the bush. And I slowed down, see if he's OK. You all right? I'm all right. Unfortunately, the other boy is left to endure the deep mud and freezing temperatures of a swamp. And as night falls, hopes of finding him grow dimmer. At one point, he told us that it, it really didn't look like they were going to find Ethan alive. It was just, just devastating. But something miraculous is about to happen. A freak accident leaves a woman unconscious and pinned beneath a massive tree. When her husband finally discovers her, it looks like it may be too late. Well, can you hear me? I felt of her neck and couldn't get a pulse, and she didn't appear to be breathing. Of course, the first thing that I thought was she could possibly be dead. Unable to move the tree on his own, their only hope is a miracle. Real footage captures the intense drama of a young man caught in a life and death situation. How will he find his way to the riverbank? On the wings of an angel? The answer on this edition of It's a Miracle. And now, from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight, an hour of tense, emotional, edge of your seat miracle rescues. Stories of people whose lives would almost certainly have been lost if it weren't for some very miraculous turns of event. We begin with a story that brought an entire community to the edge of a swamp in search of a missing child. But ultimately, it wasn't a person who saved this boy's life. It was a very special guardian angel. The farming community of Sunderland, near Toronto, Ontario, Canada, is home to the Murray family starting point of a phenomenal miracle. It was a year ago, Easter Monday, and of course the kids were off school because it's a holiday. And Stephen wanted to have a friend over, and he called Ethan Beatty, who lives just down the road. And they asked if they could go outside and play down at Stephen's Fort, which is on our property in a field. So I said yes, as long as they uh, didn't go into the bush, which they know not to do. And I kept watching from the window. Kathy Murray wasn't the only one watching the children that day. Stephen's dog, a black lab mix named Elmo, was also following them everywhere they went. We just were going to build our fort until we saw some kids. Hey, kid. Yeah? There's a pond up in those woods. They asked us if we wanted to go catch frogs, and we said, OK. Kathy noticed the other children arrive, but didn't pay much attention until suddenly, a few moments later, they were all gone. All five children disappeared into the woods. Tracy, I don't see Stephen and Ethan. So on, we me. decided we better go down and see what was going on. Stephen! Kathy and her daughter Tracy ran down to the tree line and called, but they the boys were out of earshot, deep in the woods. Well, guys, this is it. You're a lot of frogs here. Like my knife. They started playing with a knife. They at the ground, and they were pretending to throw it at Elmo. Elmo, come here, boy. Here. So we walked away. Well, we better go. Yeah, we gotta go. Come on, Elmo. Let's go this way. Well. As the boys headed back towards Stephen's home, they took a wrong turn and ended up on a path taking them deeper into the woods. Ethan! We probably called for about 15 minutes, and the three kids came out, and no sign of Stephen or Ethan or Elmo. Hey, kids, come here. 
and I well, asked them where the any... boys were. I don't know. I haven't seen them. What? You, you were just over at the fort with him about a half hour ago. Now I want you to tell me where he and Ethan are. I don't know. They said, well, they thought the boys had gone home. Well, I knew they weren't at home. As Stephen and Ethan kept going, the brush became more and more impenetrable. Ethan lagged behind and was finally forced to stop when his pants got caught on a thorn bush. Ethan stopped and I didn't realize he stopped. So I kept on walking. I looked back and Ethan wasn't there, so I called Ethan and he didn't hear me, so then I decided to go for help. At this critical moment, Elmo did something very unusual. He left Stephen's side and headed back the way they'd come, searching for the young boy left behind. Elmo! Hey, Elmo! Stephen continued on alone. I had to go about a quarter of a mile to get across the swamp. Then when I was just about at the road, I had to swim in the freezing cold water to get to the road. Just as Stephen pulled himself from the deep channel of water and started climbing up to the road, Dave Renshaw, a cable company contractor, drove by. I was on my way home. I take that route quite often. It's a shortcut for me. And I see this little boy coming out of the bush. And I slowed down, see if he's OK. You all right? I'm all right. And he was standing there, and from his chest down, he's soaking wet. You need a ride home? Yeah. I said, hop around the side of the truck and get in the back, because he's dripping wet. Get him in the van, I start driving figure, and he just lives down the road. But Stephen had ended up on a road far from his own and would never have made it home before nightfall without Dave Renshaw's help. Stephen! It must have been about quarter after four. And just as I was heading to the house, a van pulled up. Oh, and Stephen jumped out, and he was all wet and muddy, and he looked really scared. Ma'am, I found your boy. Oh, thank you. Well, where's the other one? There were two of them. He was all alone. Oh, no, you didn't see Ethan? No. Honey, go to the house. And the driver said, oh, I picked him up over on the next road over, which is a mile away from our house. So she said she was going to get her vehicle and head over, and I said I'd head back. Oh, thank you Now so Kathy much. knew that Ethan was in serious trouble. I went in the house, and I called Ethan's mom, Lori. Kathy phoned over and told me that there was a problem. Um, Ethan and Stephen went into the woods, and uh, Ethan is missing. What do you mean he's missing? Ethan I thought she was back. joking. I kind of laughed it off and said, he'll turn up, you know. And she said, no, Lori, he's lost. He's out down in the swamp somewhere. And we had to go and find him. By now, Ethan and Elmo had almost made it to the road. But when they came to the channel of water, Ethan, who couldn't swim, chose instead to follow it downstream, looking for a place to cross. He had no way of knowing that he was heading into quicksand. This exciting story continues when it's a miracle returns. When Stephen Murray and Ethan Beatty wandered into the woods one afternoon in April, they soon became disoriented and lost. Stephen managed to find his way out and onto a road where luckily help was available. But Ethan wasn't as lucky. And as the day wore on, he began to wander into even more dangerous territory. Cold and wet, Ethan left his waterlogged jacket in the mud and continued to look for a way out. He climbed a tree and spotted a duck hunter's cabin in the distance. Ethan started towards the shelter, unaware that he was heading into the worst part of the swamp, where the mud was so deep it was like quicksand. Meanwhile, the boy's mothers met Dave Renshaw on the road where Stephen had been found, but there was no sign of Ethan. Hey. I haven't seen a thing. I've been up and down here a couple of times. 
Mr. Renshaw said, look, I think we're in serious trouble here. Where Stephen had come out, it was quite deep water, and it was very menacing looking. We got really scared at that point, and especially Laurie, because she said Ethan doesn't swim. And as soon as she saw the water, you know, all, all kinds of things go through your head, I guess. I'm looking at the sun, it's starting to sink, and it's still cool that time of year. I said, I think it's time we phone the authorities. Hi, my son is lost out in the woods. And yeah, Lori used her cell phone to alert the police and, the and then returned home where Ethan's father, Alistair, was anxiously waiting. Lori, so for God's sake, what's going on? <laughs> they still haven't found him yet. There's all these stories of numerous people that never come out of this area that goes all the way up to Beaverton through behind everybody's farm through here. We need to go over there now, okay? Come on. Together, they would begin a new search from the spot at Kathy's home where the boys first disappeared. But before they could start, the police arrived on the scene. Sir, sir, I need to get you to come out of the woods, please, sir. The police told us not to go back into the woods because they said it would uh, throw off the dog's track. They brought tracker dogs with them. As the canine units attempted to follow Ethan's trail, a full-scale rescue effort was being launched. But for Ethan, it was too late. He was already so far out in the watery swamp that he was unreachable by land. It was getting colder and colder. Like, we had layers of clothing on. That's how cold it was. We just couldn't even imagine, like, poor Ethan's out there <laughs> somewhere, not dressed, you know, properly at all. As hypothermia began setting in, Ethan's struggle through the deep mud became harder and harder. For the adults waiting and praying, their one consolation was that Elmo might still be with the boy. Because he hadn't come home with Stephen and he hadn't shown up back at our house, we were sure that he was with Ethan somewhere. Like wherever Ethan was, the dog would be, or vice versa, if they found the dog, they'd find Ethan. So they did radio to the uh, rescue people that, to be on the lookout for a black dog named Elmo. <laughs> For Lori Beatty, deep concern had turned to despair. As time progresses, it's just harder and harder to believe that this is really happening and that it's happening to you, and you're just numb the whole time. So at that point, basically all we could do was stand on the side of the road, and, and uh, I, I drove back and forth on the hills of binoculars trying to see into the swamp, but couldn't find anything. It was dusk when a helicopter search unit finally arrived. They hovered around in one spot for quite a while, and standing on the road looking. We thought maybe they had spotted them. Then they radioed back and said all they could see was uh, coyotes and wolves running around. They saw no sign of a dog and no sign of a boy. At this point, Ethan was too cold and tired to go on. He laid down on a clump of grass with Elmo close by, trying to keep the boy warm. The canine dogs finally came out with the police officers and they decided that uh, Ethan was down in the swamp somewhere. They had tracked him as far as they could track on foot. They had picked up his scent and they had lost it. They said he was in the swamp somewhere. Well, I think we sort of lost hope then for a little while. It would come and go. I mean, then, as the night went on, especially after the search, the helicopter sir didn't do the job and then, then it got darker and it was cold. It was a dropping below zero. District Chief Dave Ballinghall of the nearby Scugog Fire Department was contacted to bring in a water rescue team. The uh, Durham Regional Police uh, realized that with it getting darker and darker that they were going to have to start searching from the, from the river and searching the shoreline of the river because uh, their land search, they couldn't go any farther. As Ethan began to pass out from hypothermia, he started sinking into the mud. Elmo kept him awake, but now even men in a boat on the distant channel of water would never be able to see or hear this small child. At one point, he told us that it, it really didn't look good, that it didn't look like they were going to find Ethan alive. When they told us that, like, I just, I, I don't even know how I felt. It was just, just devastating. The dramatic conclusion when it's a miracle continues. The search for nine-year-old Ethan Beatty has reached a fever pitch. Canine and helicopter units have failed to 
up anything. And now, a water rescue team is their only hope. Our feeling was not a, an upbeat feeling. We knew that we would put the boat in the water and that the boys would go out and do the best that they could. And that's all they could do. We would search until somebody would, would just say, OK, the search is off. The firemen launched their boat and began searching the vast swamp from the water. But spotting Ethan would be almost impossible. He had sunk into the mud up to his neck. And as his body temperature dropped, he began losing consciousness. Only Elmo licking his face was keeping him from passing out completely. It was probably around 10.30. I was starting to give up on it. We haven't found him yet, but you're going to have to realize that uh, he's been in the water an awful long time, and there might be a chance that he won't be found alive. We're doing the best we can. <laughs> and uh, it just didn't seem like it was going to have a good ending at all at that point. The only thing that we could see from shore then was the, the spotlights that they were using swinging back and forth, and we could hear them calling out. Ethan! Ethan, are you there? But there was no reply, just darkness and silence. And then, in the distance, a faint sparkle of light. At first, they couldn't tell what it was, but as they got closer, something moved. They walked in. They figured they went about 100 feet from where the boat was to where the see the animal. Yeah, there he is, over there. So at this time, it was just an animal. They weren't sure what it was. When they got closer, they realized that it was a dog. They finally were within about 10, maybe 15 feet, and they could see Ethan's head sticking up out of the mud. We found him! We found him! They found him. They're bringing him in. I heard them call out that they had found him. I thought I would be jumping for joy when I heard those words, but I just held my breath, because then your real nightmare begins, you know, is he okay, and, you know, will he be okay, and is he alive? Lori and Alistair rushed to their car and headed for the bridge where their son would arrive. Meanwhile, the message came through that Ethan was alive. The elation went through everybody. Uh, you could hear everybody cheering kind of in behind, the police were, were happy. You just pick up so much because our, our fears were, you know, a, an unsuccessful rescue. It took forever for them to navigate the windy little river to get him to shore. All right, let's go! And then they finally brought him to shore and he was in shock and uh, hypothermic and his eyes were open but he wasn't aware of what was going on and that. I ran up and, uh, to his head, you know, to tell him I was there, but he just wasn't uh, cognizant of anything that was happening to him at that point. It was very emotional. You could see the fear in the parents' eyes, and Ethan's mother, when she looked down at him, you know, it still brings a tear to my eyes now. Excuse me. But everybody was happy because it was such a success. I felt really happy because I knew my friend was OK, and I was sort of speechless. But what had happened to Elmo? He'd refused to get into the boat with the rescuers, and so he was still somewhere out in the swamp. My husband took the car and drove around to where they had brought Ethan out, and he started calling for Elmo. All of a sudden, he just saw this black head start bounding along the river. He'd jump on a clump, and he'd fall in the water, and he'd jump on a clump, and, and he didn't look any worse for the wear, other than he was muddy, and he jumped right in the car, and home he came. <laughs> muddy. <laughs> and he received a hero's welcome, for without Elma, this incredible story would have had a very different ending. If Elma would have came with me, Ethan would have died because he would have fell asleep and died of hypothermia in the water. He probably thought that I knew my way out and Ethan didn't know his way out, so he stayed with Ethan, and I think that's a miracle. I really do believe that Ethan probably wouldn't have survived if it hadn't been for Elmo. 
I just think of him being out there all by himself and how scary it is. Out there in the woods and the swamp and he had the companionship of the dog. And the doctor did tell us too that if Ethan had dropped off to sleep, his core temperature would have dropped right down. So by the dog keeping him awake and licking him, I really do believe that he, he is a hero. <laughs> Without the dog, Ethan wouldn't have survived. We wouldn't have found him. The three lads on the boat said there was no way they could see Ethan. They saw the dog's eyes, and that's the only thing that took them in there was the dog's eyes. I think I almost saved my life. He kept me warm, and he protected me. But I do think it's a miracle. For his life-saving heroism, Elmo was named Pet of the Year by the Canadian SPCA, and he was inducted into the Purina Hall of Fame. He joins us now with a few of his human friends. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hi. So who's the big hero here? Elmo. Well, I guess that's unanimous. Aside from all the awards and everything, and how has this changed Elmo's life? Elmo's now getting mail. He got a card in the mail from his brother, Butch. Wouldn't you know, when you're famous, all your relatives come out of the woodwork. He has a brother? Yes, his yeah. dog brother. It, uh, it said, way to go, way to go, Elmo, you're, you're my hero. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, I guess Butch just read about the, <laughs> his brother in the paper, <laughs> decided to send a note. <laughs> so he's a big celebrity now. Is he getting the star treatment? Yeah, we went to dinner with Elmo. Oh, yeah the SPCA awards, and yeah. Elmo got to sit there at the table, too. <laughs> Didn't you, Elmo? <laughs> How's he handling all the attention? Pretty good. <laughs> I think his head's a little swelled now. He... He's gained a few pounds. Yeah. He's... <laughs> well, he certainly deserves it. There's no question. He did something really special for Ethan. Well, definitely in our minds, he's, uh, he's Ethan's guardian angel in that aspect. I mean, uh, if it wasn't for Elmo, Ethan wouldn't be here. So we certainly feel Ethan, uh, uh, Elmo, Certainly is Ethan's guardian angel. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that, I think. Yeah. Oh, me too. Me too. And I want to thank you for sharing your incredible story with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye, Richard. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs> we'll be right back with another miraculous rescue. Coming up... A young man is trapped in the middle of one of the most dangerous rivers in the world with no way out and night quickly approaching. There's a couple of problems that darkness presented to us. One is that Brian had only a pair of uh, shorts on, so we knew that he was beginning to get cold. The other problem that night gives you is, is obviously visibility, and I opted not to go to darkness if possible because of the potential dangers to the rescuers and Brian. The clock is ticking, and with each passing second, Brian's life is on the line. But first, the harrowing tale of a woman trapped beneath hundreds of pounds of tree trunk and limbs, and the family who watches helplessly as the life is crushed out of her. She saw her mother laying under the tree, and she just flipped out. It looked awful. It just looked like a situation that there could be no good outcome for. When It's a Miracle continues. And now, once again, Richard Thomas. If part of a miracle is being in the right place at the right time, well, our next rescue couldn't help but be miraculous. It involves several angels who unexpectedly end up on the same small street in Birmingham, Alabama, and change the course of one very lucky woman's life. On October 8, 1999, Steve Parrish and his wife Valerie were busy working in their yard, unaware that a terrible accident was about to happen. It was my daughter's birthday, and we were going to clean up the yard some because we did have a lot of people coming over to the house. I was mowing, and Val was running the edger. Just a few feet away from where Valerie was working stood a Bradford pear tree. It had grown too large to support its own weight, and suddenly, it snapped. Ah! 
Steve was on the side of the house and couldn't hear anything over the din of the lawnmower. But when he turned it off, he heard something strange. The next door neighbor dog was barking. Choo Choo was normally a quiet dog and almost never barked. So I went over to the tree and I couldn't believe it, you know, that it just split in half and I didn't hear it or anything. It looks like it would make a, a loud cracking noise or at least hear it hit the ground because it was probably over a thousand pounds. And that's when I realized that she was under the tree and the blade at the edge of it was just spinning inches from her head. Bow! Can you hear me? I felt of her neck and couldn't get a pulse, and she didn't appear to be breathing. Of course, the first thing that I thought was she could possibly be dead. Steve tried to lift the tree off her body without success. I had just had extensive surgery on my shoulder, so I had limited use of my right arm. Steve needed a miracle, and it began when Nancy Scott drove by, a stranger who never intended to be on St. Anne Street that day. I was on my way home, listening to my radio, and getting home a little quick. So I decided to go around an extra block and hear the end of the story. And as I drove up St. Anne, I saw something strange was going on in the yard. There was a trees across the driveway and the man running around. And I just knew that something terrible had happened. While Nancy was turning her car around, Steve ran into the house to get his daughter, Leslie, and a friend to help. She saw her mother laying in the tree, and she just flipped out. She was laying in a big pool of blood there on the concrete. It looked awful. It just looked like a situation that there could be no good outcome from. It was time for Choo Choo to call for help. His owner, Kay Chinoweth, should have already left the house that day. Things kept hindering me from leaving. The phone would ring or I'd need to get something else, and so I was kind of scurrying around inside. Oh, no, something's going on across the street. Kay! Call 911. Listen, I need to call you back. Okay, bye. Quick, hurry. What for? And she's going, you know, well, why? She didn't know what well, was what happening. Tell them? The lady said, may I help you? Is this an emergency? And I said, yes. And she said, tell me what it is, and I still didn't know yet. So I got over there and I said, my neighbor is underneath the tree and it's very serious and, you know, please get somebody here right now. He said, you know, we should try to get the tree off of her. And the neighbor and I just reflex tried to grab hold of it and pick it up. And the minute that we picked the tree up, you could just hear Valerie go, like she had not been breathing the whole time. Valerie was breathing but unconscious and suffering from serious head trauma. A traumatic brain injury is a terrible thing and a person can die with it if things weren't done quickly and help didn't come. The dramatic conclusion when it's a miracle continues. While working in her yard one October morning, Valerie Parrish was suddenly pinned under the trunk and branches of a massive tree. And she might have laid there dying if it weren't for a series of miracles. A usually quiet dog who began frantically barking. A woman who accidentally drove down the street at exactly the right moment. And a neighbor who should have left her home much earlier. Together, they managed to lift the tree off Valerie's injured body, all the while praying for the strength to hold it there a few minutes longer. About that time is when the paramedics arrived. And they had their chainsaws out, and they were ready to go. We saw them pull her out from underneath the tree, but we knew that it was really serious when they wanted to fly in the life support to take her out. The helicopter's gonna be here approximately six to eight minutes. We're gonna transport her by ground ambulance up to the landing zone. While they were stabilizing her and getting her loaded up on the ambulance, since we're a block and a half from the clubhouse, they determined that they could land the helicopter up there on the parking lot. That decision would put into place the final miracle of the day, Dr. Jim Lewis. 
Well, it's unusual for me to be home in the middle of the day. We were getting ready to go for a uh, family outing and had decided on sort of a spur of the moment to warm the car up and just drive it around the block. I uh, then saw the group of neighbors and uh, the ambulance. I thought, wow, I better see if I can just be of assistance and take a look. Doctor, Dr. Watts, right I'm sorry. Right what happened here? Oh, uh, we got a 46 year old white female that had a tree fall on her. What I found was a little more serious than what I had thought. Um, Valerie was unresponsive, and uh, when I uh, shone a light in her eyes, um, I was shocked to see that her pupils were very dilated and did not respond to light. This is not good. Uh, pupils are fixed and dilated. We have she could have had a hemorrhage inside of her, her brain, and, and uh, since we were uh, in the middle of nowhere in the back of an ambulance, I was concerned that, that she wouldn't survive. Valerie was quickly airlifted to the nearest trauma center. Her husband, her daughter, and her daughter's friend arrived shortly thereafter by car. So doctors, any change in the situation? They didn't paint a very pretty picture. I was asking them, if she does come out of this coma, will she have all her faculties? Will she remember things? And they said, well, you know, to begin with, we don't know if she's going to come out of this. One of the positive things was that she didn't have a single broken bone. The main thing that they were worried about was neurological problems. And when you're sitting there waiting, it's just the worst feeling in the world. Valerie was in a coma for most of the day. And then, without warning, Steve's prayers were answered. Mm. Mr. Parrish? Yes? I think there's somebody that might want to talk to you. Oh, great. I couldn't, couldn't get in there quick enough. Great. Of course, they had her intubated. And they give you medication to keep you calm on the respirator. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. And of course, she didn't know what had happened. She didn't know where she was, why she was there, or what had happened to her. I could not remember anything about what happened with the accident. I don't remember a tree falling on me. I don't remember hearing it. I don't remember any of that. So I guess I had the easy part, <laughs> really. Four days later, Valerie was released from the hospital. Her first stop, to thank the paramedics who treated her. Oh, you're the lady that got hit by the tree. Oh my gosh, how are you doing? Yeah, good. The secretary the said, you wait, I've got to get the guys yeah, that came over to your house because yeah. they didn't think you were going to make it and they'll be so happy to see you. Hey guys, y'all come on in here and see who's here. We got the tree How you getting along? Yeah, I'm fine. They were very excited to see us and, and to hear what happened and, and to see the outcome. Well, I just wanted to let everybody know I appreciate you so much. I'm just, I, I'm just so thankful. I can't thank you guys enough. You just always hear about your guardian angel, and I think that everyone that responded were just my guardian angels, but especially that dog. If he had not just been there, I would have never been discovered. I see it as a miracle because there were so many people that happened up at that split second that they needed to be there. And if it had not been for Kay and for Nancy, along with Steve, to hold the trunk up off of me, I couldn't have gone that long without breathing. If she had not had the tree taken off of her right away, I think she was very close to developing more permanent problems, brain damage or even death. She's absolutely back to A1 normal. I think as long as she's careful which tree she trims grass under in the future, she should be fine. Oh, it's so good to see you awake. Something happened that day. As close to a miracle as I've ever been close to. Valerie Parrish continues to be in good health, and she's very thankful for the miraculous events that saved her life. She joins us now with her husband and daughter. Hey, everyone. This is where you're supposed to say hello, Richard. <laughs> We're sorry. <laughs> the questions aren't going to get any easier. <laughs> OK, all right. Let's try to get this back on track. Leslie, you must have been very upset the day your mother was injured. Yes, I was, like, hysterical. So it must have been an incredible relief when you found out she was going to be all right. I, I was, like, so happy because I thought she was going to die, and then I wouldn't have a mom, so that'd be really hard. Yeah, it sure would, but she's sitting there right beside you now. How does that make you feel? I'm just glad she's here because I love her so much, and now that I realize that she came through this, something's like big's gonna happen, and she'll have to be there for me and Dad when it does. Mom, what do you have to say about all this? 
<laughs> I guess Can't actions speak louder than words. Any final thoughts? It's just uh, uh, something that's made us slow down and, and enjoy certain things in our life that we've taken for granted. We, we kind of enjoy every day a little bit more than we did before. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thanks. Good night. Goodbye. Goodbye. We'll be right back. Coming up next, how did this young man end up on a rock in the middle of a raging river? And more importantly, how could he get off it without losing his life? Rescue two. There's a subject in the river. We were on scene quickly within about 15 minutes, and Sergeant Fester and I assessed the situation real quick, realized we had to start weighing the factors of whether we wanted to risk putting rescuers in a boat in the water, setting up a rope system where we can ferry the boats out to the victim and do it in the quickest method because it was late in the evening uh, and we were gonna run out of daylight. Another miracle rescue right after this. Our next miracle rescue is even more incredible in that it was actually caught on videotape. And I think you'll agree that the real footage you're about to see perfectly captures the sheer terror and desperation of a seemingly hopeless situation. But it also captures the moment when all of that is miraculously turned around. The Kern River in Central California is considered one of the most dangerous rivers in North America. Its waters have claimed hundreds of lives, and the number keeps growing year after year. It was on a hot afternoon in July when 20-year-old Brian Kinder and his cousin Joey left Bakersfield, California, and headed for their favorite swimming hole on the Kern River. It was a trip they'd made many times before, but on this afternoon, the Kern was raging with the heaviest mountain runoff it had carried in years. The two boys wasted no time in preparing to jump into the cool waters. Brian positioned himself on one of the higher rocks and took the plunge. He was immediately sucked underwater and pulled rapidly downstream. His cousin ran along the bank, praying that Brian would make it to shore. But when he saw that he'd landed on a rock in the middle of the raging waters, he ran for help. This is Control 5. Are you reporting an emergency? Yes, I am. I am uh, at call box number one. The call set in motion the Kern County Sheriff's Department rescue team and its leader, Marty Williamson. Rescue 2. There's a subject in the river. We were on scene quickly within about 15 minutes, and Sergeant Fester and I assessed the situation real quick, realized we had to start weighing the factors of whether we wanted to risk putting rescuers in a boat in the water, setting up a rope system where we can ferry the boats out to the victim, and do it in the quickest method because it was late in the evening, uh, and we were gonna run out of daylight. There's a couple of problems that darkness presented to us. One is that Brian had only a pair of uh, shorts on, and had been in the water swimming, so we knew that he was beginning to get cold. The other problem that night gives you is, is obviously visibility, and I opted not to go to darkness, if possible, because of the potential dangers to the rescuers and Brian. The team decided that their only hope to save the boy was a helicopter rescue, but the only chopper in the area was not equipped with a cable and a hoist system necessary for rescue work. Cal Schlosshauer was piloting that day. When we got the call, we were en route up the canyon to check the river for a uh, drowning victim that had gone down about a week before. Uh, at the time, there were four other victims in the river from four separate accidents. So when we found that Brian was stuck on a rock, we wanted to get him off real bad. It would be an extremely dangerous operation. The ground team would do everything in their power to ensure Brian's safety. We were utilizing the line gun with Brian's rescue in an attempt to get a line across far enough to slide a uh, helmet and life jacket down to him. The line gun didn't work in this instance just simply because the canyon was wider at that particular area than we had expected. Time had run out, 
It was now or never for the daring rescue. The plan included having him actually climb over the skid so that he was sitting on the skid, and then to grab a hold of the strut of the helicopter, which leans inward toward the pilot. And we felt at that point he would have a firm enough grip on the helicopter that we could move him the 30 or 40 feet to a, a landmass where we could make the rescue. Flight observer John Hartman was placed on the riverbank to help guide the helicopter into the narrow canyon. My job was to communicate to Cal basically all the, the risks that were around him, the things that were close to his rotor system and close to his tail so that he wouldn't come down and uh, touch the rotor on any of the rocks. My main concern was being able to see Brian, and John was able to watch my tail for things that I couldn't see. One wrong move and two lives could be lost. It was now up to Brian to climb under the helicopter skid without disturbing its balance. Problem was, as I got closer, he grabbed onto the front of the skid, and by that time, he was committed. He was on the helicopter, and I couldn't tell him to get back off. As soon as he wrapped his hands around the skid, I, I went, oh, no, because <laughs> I knew what was coming. The way he grabbed on, boy, it was an e-ticket ride for both of us, and I was afraid he'd, he'd slip. I didn't know how cold he was, how slippery his hands were. You know, he was just holding on to the skid. Moments later, the miracle that everyone was praying for became reality. Brian was back on solid ground. Miraculously, he escaped with only a scratch on his leg, and one week later, he had the opportunity to meet the two men who'd saved his life. Good to see you again. You get the prize for being the scariest passenger I ever had. I've never had anybody hanging on the skid of my helicopter before. Why don't you uh, come on out and we'll put you on the other side and we'll take you for a little ride. I was thinking about it later and it didn't really hit me that much that I almost died. I was very lucky to make it out, I was very lucky. There are four dead bodies in that river at the time that we made this rescue. That's why it was so important to get him off the rock. If he had fallen off that rock, if he'd slipped or whatever, we wouldn't be here with him today. None of the miraculous rescues you've seen tonight would have been possible without the help of trained professionals. And our hats are off to all the police, firemen, and paramedics who dedicate their lives to saving others. Well, that's our show for this evening. I want to thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night.